Thank you all for coming. Uh, basically, the premise of the talk is uh, a little bit about what are RTOs or a broader superset token generating events. I think that's the latest parlance that we're pushing out of Switzerland. The different kinds of them and what are kind of, some of the regulatory problems and moral hazards and other things and maybe my opinion on where the hell it's all going. So what is a token generating event? We got three different types. Got the ICO. That's what everybody's doing right now. $1.3 billion raised so far. Got people copy and pasting code, changing a name, putting a new name in, raising 200 million, not to name any ventures or anything like that. Uh, other people making great claims and that's fun and we'll get to that in a bit. Then you have two other forms. One is called proof of burn. Anybody know what proof of burn is? Show of hands. A few of the oldies in the space. And what was the first proof of burn? You got it, right? And what is proof of burn? It's an upgrade. You take a token, you destroy the token, and you get a new token. It's a really interesting uh, device, and actually it doesn't seem to pass the Howey test in my view. Then you had a share drop. Anybody know what a share drop or an airdrop is? You ever hear this term before, show of hands? Uh, a couple of people. So anybody know about Ethereum and Ethereum Classic? What happened there? We took Ethereum and then took the UTXO, copied it over, and now we have two Ethereums, Ethereum Classic and Ethereum. It's a share drop. So if you had one Ether, you have an Ether Classic as well. Now the rational actor would say, well, that's impossible because the minute you do it, the p new coin will die because everybody just makes infinite profit, right? As soon as you get it, it's free money. You should sell it till it goes to zero. But East TC is actually over a billion. It's doing quite well. So share drops actually can result in a stable ecosystem with lots of money. So these are kind of the three vehicles. And I've been in the space long enough to actually witness all of them be used to various degrees of success. The first ICO I'm aware of was MasterCoin. There may have been some decentralized crowdfunding on Bitcoin talk prior to that, but MasterCoin was like the first one to do an Exodus address and all this stuff. J.R. Willett had the Bitcoins on his laptop or desktop, and they rushed and created some Delaware company to actually do a legal structure, and they raised like $500,000. And at the time, they were proud, man. They were like, wow. One month, we raised $500,000 off of Bitcoin talk. Oh my God, this is so cool. And then later on, Dan Larimer, working with some guys, uh, did angel shares, and they raised like $4 million. And everybody's like, whoa, this is so cool. Then the big daddy was Ethereum. Everybody remember that one? It was $18 million. My God, how are they ever gonna spend all that money? Now you do an ICO today, it's like $18 million. Oh God, how did it fail? You know, what did you guys do wrong in your marketing or something? So the point is that we're going up like an order of magnitude, basically every time, every event. And that's a good indication that there's probably gonna be a bubble and there's probably gonna be a collapse. The other thing is that we're no longer talking about what is the technology, what is the purpose, do you have a right to exist, a reason to exist, do you want to change the world, what are you gonna do with the money? It's all about ROI. That's another indication that there's a bubble. You see people who got really lucky with Ethereum or really lucky with Bitcoin and it got 100X, they say, hmm, well, this new token, yeah, people are gonna, like bats, yeah, you know, everybody's gonna be after that shit. Let's put in some money, we'll get a 10X, right? And so you're actually taking lucky people and they're doubling down to be lucky again. So I believe what we're in for is going to be some form of a bubble and the bubble's gonna collapse. And uh, then that'll draw on the regulators. So that's kind of the premise of the talk today is to have a little bit of a discussion about what are some of the moral hazards that I've seen or I think in the space and also what would a regulatory event look like in my opinion and what would the aftermath be if such a thing occurred. So it's probably a glum, morbid speech, but uh, I get to tell it because y'all came. So anyway, what, uh, what are some of the moral hazards? Well, first off, we're not doing KYC and AML in a lot of these offerings. What is KYC and AML? Anybody run an exchange? I know you do. Okay, so basically, let's say John. You say you're John O'Connor, right? Okay, you say that. But I don't know that unless you provide some evidence to that. Now, why would I want that? Well, I know you're a unique human being. That's the first thing. So let's say we have a crowd sale and 5,000 people participate and all send funds to this Exodus address. How many are real people and how many are just transactions? The only way you can know that for certain is with KYC and AML. You have to do compliance or else it could be one guy who created 5,000 transactions and sent it to the Exodus address. Now why would you do that? Any ideas? Well, what if you are an insider? Where's the money going? To yourself and you're creating coins out of thin air doing this. And then there's a hype cycle. So when it goes way up, you sell the new coins you've created and you make a 5X or 10X in the money that you just put in. And it's 
anonymous, right? Nobody knows, nobody sees it. You say, oh, I don't know who these people are, they're people over the internet. Furthermore, you know, there are foundations that are doing these events. And what do legal entities have? They have bank accounts. And so what does a banker have to do? Anybody in banking here? Anybody ever been in banking here? Show of hands. Have the courage? Okay. <laughs> so, so this one guy over there who's very courageous, uh, and, the, and the ones who aren't courageous, uh, what do they have to do when you open an account? They do KYC and AML. And they also have this thing called origin of funds, right? So when you have an account, like a business, that's brand new, and they have $10 million that came out of damn nowhere, and you call them into the office and you say, hey guys, where'd you get this $10 million from? What do they say? Oh yeah, it's so cool, you know, we did this crowd sale, we got it from all these people over the internet, we don't know where they're at, could be in Iran, you know, who cares? It's so awesome, man, it's great. Is that like a high-risk bank account or is that a low-risk bank account, right? So that's a problem. Then you have a litany of other moral hazards, like how do you spend $200 million? I run a company, we operate in 10 countries, we have 100 people, we have three research partnerships, one at Edinburgh, one at Tokyo Tech, one at Athens, and I would not be able to spend this much money. It would be so devastating to us as a company. First, think about wages. You have a guy come on board and say, I ask him, how much do you want to be paid per month? He says, $25,000 a month, because he knows you have $200 million, right? There's no, oh, I don't have the money to pay you. There's none of this discussion, because everybody publicly knows you have this much value in your back pocket. Furthermore, you start thinking, well, you know, I can take business class. Well, you know, I can do five-star hotel. I earned it, I got all this capital. And lo and behold, your expenses go way up. You don't work any harder. Your people don't work any harder. In fact, they're actually thinking more about the money than the project or the product. And so you actually execute slower. Jawbone is a great example of that. If you get overfunded, it's just as bad as being underfunded. And this is a phenomenon that I think a lot of these ICOs are gonna be facing soon enough. And the other thing is that your investors, the people buy these tokens, they have an expectation of a return. How many people gave money to an ICO and said, you know, I don't care what they do with the money. I don't care if the token goes up. Yeah, it's, it's fine. I love the mission and the vision and the principle. You know, if it's, if it's your favorite charity, maybe. But for a lot of these guys, they're like, oh, that's a good investment. That's going to be 5x. They've got some good people. So you raise $200 million. Now, your guys want a billion dollar capitalization. And they want you to do it in two years or less. How do you do that? Especially if the market's in a bubble and the bubble collapses. I think Bancor raised 150 or 60 now. What if it goes to 10? Are you going to have happy people who are all copacetic and they're feeling great about life? No. So the problem is that the Securities Exchange Commission, which is kind of the big watchdog for a lot of this stuff, is in between a rock and a hard place. On one hand, they say, you know, we don't want to stifle innovation. We want to allow this model to grow and persist. But on the other hand, we're starting to see a moral hazard. It's growing up by an order of magnitude every generation. You have obvious structuring schemes where people go and hide in Switzerland or somewhere else. They operate in America, so their substance is in America, but their form is in Switzerland, so there's kind of a tax evasion component to that. And they have no moral or, or ethical obligation, in their view, to the buyers. If you read the terms of sale of a lot of these ICOs, they say things like, you have no rights, it's a donation. If we go spend the money on our favorite extracurricular activities, it's just as good as writing code and there's not a damn thing you can do about it. And there's no consumer protection, why? Because they didn't do KYC and AML. So how do you know how to help the people? How do you know how to assist them? If Bob says, I bought your ICO, and he comes to you six months a year later, and he says, well, I lost my credentials, you can't go check his passport and say, yeah, you match our records. You don't know who Bob is. So you can't issue a new certificate, you, you can't, use a backup recovery archive, you can't do any of this stuff. You just say, Bob, you've lost everything, so sorry. So you get a situation where people are irrational, you have massive amounts of money, you have a lot of corporate malfeasance, you have a lot of potential insider trading, a lot of board transitivity, and no regard whatsoever to consumer protection. This is the environment our space is currently in, whether we want to admit it or not. So. What will happen? Well, bubbles break. They always do. And when they break, all these ventures get defunded. Then, that's a great time for the SEC to come in. A great time for class action lawsuits. And they have seven years to do it, called statutes of limitation. They can still go after the master coin guys if they want to. And then every one of these ICO guys has to argue why they don't pass the Howey test. How many of them got a legal opinion on that? 
Not, I talked to a lawyer and the lawyer said, yeah, it's probably not. Now there's something like serious, like a more likely than not opinion, where they had to do research and provide an argument and the law firm stands behind it. Probably not many. How many got a no action letter from the SEC? None. So no one's protected if they've sold into the United States. And then you have some people get clever who are like, well, I, I didn't send and sell into the United States, wink, wink. But if you don't do KYC AML, how do you know? Yeah, there's already decisions that the SEC has made that you have to do that to blacklist them. And if you don't, well, you probably did. There was a certain venture that shall remain nameless that bragged about how they didn't sell into the United States. And then I'll write on Times Square's billboard, their logo's there. And there's trucks driving through Manhattan with their logo on the side. And let me get this straight, that's not a road show. That's not advertising to US purchasers who will use VPNs or other things to evade and buy in. Why would you market if you're not selling into this jurisdiction? So there's a lot of precedent. Now, if they do get involved, what happens? Well, you get double whammied. First off, if a token is a security, you can't sell it on an exchange. Why is that exchange? Because you need broker dealer, right? You need special licenses to sell securities. You can't list normal uh, instruments like that. Okay, so we'll see tokens get delisted from American exchanges and probably international exchanges as well as part of risk mitigation. Furthermore, the banks, they're going to say, these are too risky, these clients. They'll drop the accounts. Okay, so they lose their bank accounts and they get delisted from exchanges and the token value goes to the toilet and then the token buyers feel defrauded and want their money back. What do they do? Class action lawsuit. That's probably, in my view, the most worst case scenario that we're looking at in this space. Maybe it'll be less draconian, but it's probably going to happen. And what's the aftermath of that going to be? Well, in my view, uh, the SEC will have to create a standard. They'll issue an administrative ruling and say something like, well, this is how you have to register. You have to do KYC and AML. You have to have some consumer protections. And they'll create some framework. They'll pick somebody really egregious. They'll throw the book at them to make an example. And then for the rest of the people, they'll give them a fine or say you have to register or do something like that. And the industry will move on. That's how this usually works. And that's how it's always worked. Now, will this stop ICOs? No, because we have other mechanisms like proof of burn, share drops. People are outside the United States legitimately. Like if you have an organization in South Korea or China, you just sell the people in China, there's no US participation, there's no jurisdiction there. It's very difficult to have that. So those will continue. And that's over 6 billion people. So I think ICOs are here to stay. I think ICOs are going to continue growing. I think we're going to have more and more and more rational exuberance. And then eventually I think it will burst. It'll contract the market a little bit. The strong will survive. A lot of the weak will get flooded out. And if you're in a developed jurisdiction like you know, countries in Western Europe or the United States, my belief is that there'll be regulation for these things. The regulation will probably be kind of hybrid. Something like the Jobs Act, something where it's somewhat easy to comply, but you'll have to have a prospectus and some notion of registration and some notion of uh, compliance. And as for the rest of the world, they'll continue like online gaming and gambling, running in a kind of a gray area market and doing gray area things. So that's my view on ICOs. It's a very pessimistic one, but I think it's a pragmatic one and I think it's a realistic one in a sense. This said, I do believe there's a lot of room for innovation in this space. And I do believe if you're an entrepreneur and you want to capitalize your company, there are a lot of really clever ways you can still do it. Like proof of burn is legitimately a great option for a lot of people. Let's say you have a great new privacy coin, for example, and you think yours is legitimately better than Monero or Zcash or any of these other guys. Okay, create an endowment and do a proof of burn. Have people destroy their token. It creates a distribution, it creates a value. They've upgraded their token, but you don't take anybody's money. And you only get paid if the token's actually worth something. So you're actually directly aligned with the people that you're working for. And you're betting on the technology, its adoption, and its growth over a period of time. That seems to be a far more sensible model. Okay, share drops are also interesting. That's where you have philosophical differences. Bitcoin may experience this. If the segregated witness debate doesn't pan out the way that we want it to, you're going to have one philosophy here, and you're going to have another philosophy here. And what does that mean? We're cloning the token. We now have two of these tokens, or more, just like Ethereum and Ethereum Classic. And the communities diverge. And because there's real people there, and there's real trading and real mining, and we split the community, we've actually now created completely different ecosystems. And those will have real value. 
So I think that those are healthy because they actually allow you to, to take an unstable community that can't advance and split up, mom and dad split up, they got a divorce, they can now go get remarried and have a better life. And you know, there's maybe a lot of business models, like maybe you want to grab someone's community, like maybe you want to compete with EOS and you think the Steam guys and the BitShare guys got screwed because they didn't get any distribution. You can just take the ownership, create a share drop and fork EOS. Maybe you'll do something there. This has actually been tried with some projects to some degree of success. So I think there's a lot of innovation here that doesn't necessarily involve an ICO. The last point I'll make is that there's a moral obligation when you take other people's money. I don't like it when people say, give me money and I don't have to do anything. It's, it's just insane to me. You take someone's money, you gotta deliver something. You have to create value, real value, or do your best. You have to wake up every day and say, well, my job is to make sure these guys have a good outcome. That's the, that's the key. And uh, I think that that's the mindset we need to return to in this space. Because the reality is that that's how Bitcoin got created. Nobody was thinking about money in the beginning days of Bitcoin because it wasn't worth anything. <laughs> if you were a core developer, it's because you were philosophically aligned with it. You believed in it. And it turned out that all the people got in early, if they stayed in, got fabulously wealthy. But that's an after effect of a philosophy and a passion. And that's why I entered the space. It's why I'm here. It's why IOHK exists. We do a lot of first principles research. We do a lot of Haskell development. It's not easy, but we do it because we love it and we're really excited about it. And we think we can do great things as a company. And if we are successful, we're a company, we're for profit, we'll do well. But my success is not measured in how much money we make. It's measured in the things that we do and the products we build and the protocols that we enable and their impact that they have. If you change the world, you're gonna get rich, either in experience or in money. So that's my brief, cynical, sleep-deprived, Greek elevator falling uh, presentation on ICOs. And I'd love to have your questions because I assume that it, we're gonna get at least one or two good ones. Thank you. So let me provide a little bit of comment on the other side of this, this picture. So I ran a publicly traded company for almost 20 years, raised $550 million of other people's money, sure. um, over 39 different transactions, um, went through a class action lawsuit, went through an SEC investigation that wasn't our fault. It was a fantastically good fun. Learn, you guys, you guys like, that one. Yeah, no, no, well, <laughs> later on, over a drink, I'll tell you the story about the settlement with the, with the judge from New Jersey oh, who could have been on, like, you know, on TV, that was fantastic. But, but the point is, is that it, it's been, it was an interesting process to go through the setting up of an ICO and the legal work for it and, and the process of getting an opinion from the legal side and, and trying to figure out the right mechanisms. Oh, oh sorry. And, then, and trying to figure out the right mechanisms to put in place. There are things that are definitely on the edges of this. The question is, do we or do we not want a token-based economic model versus an equity-based economic model? And, and, and so the real change opportunity here, and I'll tell you where the real risk is and the huge opportunity. The risk is we as companies should not use tokens as compensation, period. Not to vendors, not to developers, not to third parties, not to founders, employees, and others. But the moment we concede to that point, we lose the fundamental benefit of the token economy, which is that there's this participation as a group in the formation of something that's a broader ecosystem. And so it moves it out of this sort of corporate culture and into this much more potentially distributed architecture. I think that's where the real battle should be balanced both for the SEC, the other regulators, and others, is that's where the innovation is that we can't really use stocks for that because, it, because the rules are tough on that side. People aren't going to give away bits and pieces of their stock to other vendors and get it all distributed around because it makes a mess out of governance of the thing. Where in tokens, I think actually what you want is mass distribution of your tokens as broadly as possible. So, so just from a slightly more optimistic side of this, by the way, I think the real thing here is, I think of this as like corporate venture done crypto style. So if you had like $100 billion, would you take 5 billion, like 5%, 
and just toss it to a bunch of complete, total lunatics. By the way, I'm a member of the lunatics crowd. So like, you give me some money, I'm like, you can't hire me from a marketing department perspective. I'm, I'm a religious fanatic, right? I, I'm gonna go out there and tell you why I need at least $20 billion of value stored on devices just to like get up in the morning. Well, that's like the current valuation of ether, right? So shh. that's just like, that's just round off air. Let's get this thing cooking. And, and so what you want is 200 lunatic executives out there running around, well-funded, as the marketing department. Because if we do our job, let's say every ICO, you average all of them and we look at it three years from now, probably pretty good, pretty good guess, zero. No gain, no loss. Some will win, some will lose. No gain, no loss. But the underlying crypto went up 500%. How many people are gonna do the trade again? Like take 5% of your position, put it in a marketing budget, and see if we can make the core underlying crypto go up. Because the problem today is, we don't really use crypto very well. We use it as a store of value. We don't really use it. Like, what's the total actual throughput and use of it for practical purpose? Not a lot. Maybe the ICO might unlock the utility of crypto on a global basis. We just don't know which ones are the winners and the losers, but we need like 100 of them. And so Intel did this a long time ago. They put a Wi-Fi chip on the PC, and then they started a $100 million venture fund, and they funded every idiot business plan that had the word Wi-Fi in it in like 2000, 2001 timeframe. Guess what? We all have Wi-Fi today as a result. And, and so I think there's an interesting aspect of this and kind of how it helps the whole ecosystem grow. We have to be careful. The points you're making about like pay attention to the details, really critical, both as buyers and on the seller side of this equation. And understand we're, we're building product. And, and we have to be careful when we build product, otherwise it will absolutely become a security. We, we don't want that to happen too, too soon. So anyway, just... My two cents. Okay. Testing. Okay, works. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, my pessimism is that I see where the industry is going and how people act. Private conversations with other CEOs and uh, the attitude people have towards token holders. Also, where the money came from. Uh, you know, if the money comes from smart money, it's like dot-com bubble, in a certain respect, built an entire industry. And, you know, there are a lot of losers, but let's be honest about where most of the money came from there. It came from VCs that were already quite wealthy, right? So they make some bets, they lose some bets, shame on them. Right now, we have a situation where a lot of people got really rich really quickly. That's one of my primary concerns. And when you get really rich really quickly, you're not smart. You're lucky. And if you don't know the difference between the two, you're soon going to be poor again. Uh, and so what's happening in a lot of these things is I think we're building kind of a house of cards where some people got really rich really quickly, and now they're realizing that value to get to another token, and it just repeats, and it just repeats, and repeats, and eventually it comes collapsing down, and there's no liquidity, and these things would happen. Now, as your point about the utility of the token, the devil is in that detail. If you get a legal opinion that says there's real utility here, the way you're using it, the way things are done, and it doesn't pass the Howey test, that's fair. You know, we did that with Ethereum. We talked to a law firm. It was an incredibly aggressive and extremely painful, time-consuming effort. And the conclusion of that was that it didn't pass the Howey test for a variety of reasons. The fact that all these ICOs are occurring on Ethereum is a good example of that. It's an enabler of these types of things. It's, it's not in itself just valued as a speculative instrument. It's an enabler of distributed computation. But you have to draw a line somewhere. And frankly, no matter how you want the token to be used, people are going to use it the way they want to use it. Some people are going to use it as a debt instrument. Some people are going to use it as a currency. And some people are going to use it as stock. Uh, and, and so the question is, does the use, the guilt of these open systems transitively come back to you? And uh, where do those boundaries end? Being an unregulated product, and given that there's a lot of moral hazards in the space, my opinion is that uh, it will be shut down as an, a funding vehicle without some form of a channel, a regulated channel. It will become regulated in some way, but it won't get shut down. This is the modern model. Well, it can't be shut down. It's a distributed system. I should say shut down in that it's no longer a lawful way of doing things the way we're doing it today. So, so didn't, didn't, what do you think of Tesla having done a, 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 an ICO? Yeah, they've done season equity offering. The difference is that, hang on. But hang on, no one has an expectation of return there. That fails the Howey test, son. Come on, if I'm buying a car to resell it at a 2x or a 3x? Okay. You had slot number five for Tesla. 
you could trade it to somebody else and they would get the car. Okay, but the vast majority of people buying slots is their opinion of an expectation of return and also is their... No, of course not. Okay. All right, so it goes on average, right? And is the vast majority of people buying a cryptocurrency, do they feel there's an expectation of return or do they want a real life utility out of it? And that's, that's the unanswered question and what the SEC has to look into at some point. Yeah, and it's a fair point, and I understand what you're saying. Ferrari has the same problem. If you like 488s, you're going to have to buy a slot because there's no way you're going to get it in two years, right? Um, let's, let's, open, let's open questions up to the floor. I've got lots of hands here. So uh, question to Charles Hoskinson. Yes, hi. Uh, name's Robert Willis, uh, executive MBA, uh, entrepreneur in the technical space. Um, we've experiencing a lot of his, uh, noise in the space of um, cryptocurrencies and with blockchain. Um, and I suppose I've got a controversial uh, statement stroke question. Uh, do you think most of the ICOs are fouled venture capitalist adventures? And so the next stop for, them, the ne the next stop for those uh, companies were to pitch to um, the populists, um, people who are not really educated or know much about how business works. And as a result, they were able to develop a white paper pitch, and as, and and we're here to we are where we are today. Um, controversial, but what's your take on that? I, I'd give Steve money, and I'd give Eric, uh, you know, money over bats. There's some very good people who have had fiduciary responsibilities before, and they certainly earned the right to try again because they have real products and there is real infrastructure there. There's there's a, a business plan they can execute. There's still a risk because it can fail, but you know that they're not going to fail because they decided to go to Barcelona for six months and disappear, you know, imbibing substances that aren't fully legal. Um, but that said, there are certainly a lot of people who are raising money with absolutely no business experience whatsoever. The challenge is that that's not a criteria itself to blacklist people, or else we wouldn't have Elon Musk. You have basically a college dropout left Stanford's physics program to go play with his brother and start Zip2. At that time, there was no legitimate reason to believe that Elon and Kimball were going to go build some empire. It was a roll of the dice. And it was the same for the most of the modern tech industry. So on one hand, um, I'm sympathetic to the idea of giving people a shot. But on the other hand, it has to be reasonable and scoped. You don't hand a 16-year-old a Ferrari. You hand him you know, a Toyota or something like that. You let him build some reputation and credibility and grow up. Because uh, the vast majority of the time, you'll have a bad outcome. Now. You're probably right uh, that a lot of these ventures are junk. But to be fair, if you're in venture capital, 90% of what crosses your deck and gets funded is junk. Think about how many of these damn social media apps we have that get a big buyout. And they're just customer acquisition plays. They've never seen a dollar of revenue. They just burn cash like crazy. Their tech stacks are absolutely dreadful. They, they, they're like always two days away from the whole service falling apart, and they get acquired just basically to get the customers and roll them into an enterprise product line from a larger company. So uh, given that this environment already exists in the traditional world, I think it is unfair to go ahead and say that somehow the cryptocurrency world is uniquely different in that respect. It's a human enterprise, and the things that people try to do in the old system, they're going to certainly try to do in the new system. Uh, and Steve, do you want to add anything to this? No, no, I, I think you're right on. Okay. Next question. Thank you. That was a good question. Okay, so my question is: um, supposing you know the, the the bubble is bursting as you predict, and uh, I'm I'm the guy from the SEC who comes along and says, "I've studied your monetary policy document. Can you explain to me why is your scheme not just a Ponzi scheme, or why is yours not and the other guy's is? What is your what is your argument to me as to why your, your scheme is not a Ponzi scheme? Right, that's a fair question as well, and it's one that's been levied against Bitcoin by traditional economists. So you know, just because you have fixed supply or a deflationary supply mechanic doesn't necessarily mean that it's problematic. It just depends on the use cases. It's store of value, are you doing something with it, and so forth. Uh, and also, why are people acquiring the token? So if you have natural demand in your system, for example, gambling, no one ever goes to the Bellagio and says, boy, I can't wait to buy some Bellagio chips. They're going to go up like 4x this weekend. It's going to be great. They don't do that. Instead, they say, I'm doing something with the chip, and the game is to get more of the chips by taking them from somebody else. Do you particularly care that the Bellagio has 100,000 chips or 200,000 chips? No, because there's, that's the game. 
if the game is I buy my chips and I'm trying to sell them to John for a 10x so he can sell it to Jane for a 10x, who can sell it to Duncan for a 10x, that's a Ponzi scheme, right? So it does depend upon what the system is being used for, how the system is represented, and the expectations that the people have. And you can look at the infrastructure, you can look at the roadmap, and you can look at the commercial attempts that derive here. Like Ethereum is an interesting example of this. So if they are actually able to realize their vision, we're talking about a computational layer for the entire internet. It's bloody mad. Bloody, bloody mad. But it's a multi-trillion dollar business we're talking about here. So as a natural consequence of the ledger doing its service, the currency will get more appreciation. Uh, but that's not the primary purpose. It's more of a, this is fuel for computation. And when I buy Ether in distant future, five years, 10 years, 15 years down the road, I might very well be just trying to fund a decentralized application. And it's just like an Amazon EC2 type of a deal for me. It's just maybe a competitor, and I need this to be decentralized because I don't trust Rackspace or Azure or whatever it might be. That could be a reality. But the thing is, is this analysis has to be done on a case-by-case -case basis. Absolutely. And if, it's, and if you try to make a blanket statement, I, I think that uh, you run into some problems because you'll inadvertently actually take some honest actors who do good things and throw the baby out with the, uh, the bathwater. That's my best non-answer to your question that I could give. Hey, uh, sorry. Uh, he's putting his hand up. Um, so I see one of the big values of cryptocurrency and, uh, and token sales as being the accessibility of them you know as opposed to buying some shares or something so if there's uh, as you say a fallout of uh, ICOs eventually what do you think what do you predict might happen to the market for the people who don't want to take on who, who still don't want to take on the legal obligation that they might have to in that kind of fallout because they don't have to because it's a decentralized unstoppable system so if I understand the question what what, can, can you repeat it, rephrase it a little bit? I, I, I just want to make sure I'm answering the right question. So if, if there's a, a fallout of the ICOs, as you say, right. and then the, you know, the NSC comes in and imposes legal obligations right. on these kind of sales, uh, there's still a whole market of people who don't have to take on that legal obligation. Sure. What do you predict for that part of the market? Okay, well, first off, remember, the SEC is powerful, but it's not God. So if their regulations come down, there's still going to be ICOs trading and all kinds of things happening. And then actually I liken it to file sharing. There's a certain degree of um, resilience to this technology. So what happened when we got music online, we got Napster, and then the government's like, ah, oh, this is crap, they shut it down, right? Then the response to that was BitTorrent and Tor and all these other things, and people started using it to anonymously share things, and now Game of Thrones is the most pirated show in history. There are more people who watch Pirated than people who actually watch the show on HBO. So if they push too hard, what will happen is that it will continue. We'll just see decentralized exchanges running in dark nets with all these things that have been put in to make it impossible to identify people. And actually, the regulators created an even bigger problem then because there's absolutely no way for consumer protection. At any point, somebody can just run an exit scam and do all these problems. So uh, I think that, first off, the regulation or not, it's not going to kill the market. Just it'll change the structure and the form of the market. And frankly, it'll make it easier for guys like Steve, because then the lawyer can say, this is absolute certainty. And he can even get a no action letter and other such things, which is not currently possible in this type of an environment. And now that this legitimate fundraising mechanism is available. The downside, though, is if it's treated too draconianly and harshly, it could actually end up hurting the market. First, innovation, and second, by dramatically reducing consumer protection by offshoring it to increasingly hostile technology. But we're here to stay. Tokens are great. I love them. And uh, the world is being tokenized. We're, it's not going anywhere. Steve, you want to add anything to that? Or? No, I, 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 the world is being tokenized. That's the whole point, right? The fundamental economic model of how we're going to compute, we've experienced. It's called cloud. So today, you can go out and buy a server, and you can give your server some rules like, hey, when you get too busy, can you just go buy some more servers? And so we gave our servers some money to buy more servers because the humans decided to all watch the same stupid funny video at 3 o'clock in the morning while everybody was sleeping, and we don't want to wake up and have to push a new server, new server. We just make it automatically happen. And so we just want to extend that concept 
from a completely centrally controlled model, which is the cloud architecture today, to the utility compute model that's out there. This is the first touch of that. So you might actually be witnessing not just the beginnings of an understanding of the economic model of the end of enterprise compute. So enterprise networking has been based on ports and passwords and spectrum and right-of-way delivering service. And we're moving to a model where service is delivered based on the identity of the device. Oh, so we need a whole new back office to run all these device identities. That's what blockchain is. You can almost think of the monetary system as just an alpha. Because we want to run the network on a global basis so I can send movies around the world completely outside of the control of the people who've been licensing right of way and spectrum. And you can't dig up the streets for three feet here putting a new network in. But Apple shipped everybody in the country an iPad and they're completely in control of the content delivery. And that's, that's the model. And we just need to open that box so that everybody can have their own iPad network. Um, this one's for you, Stephen. Um, I think you correctly identified that the current ratio of economic value and economic applications to speculative cash in, in blockchain is currently very, very low. Uh, I think from there you go on to say that what you expect this wave of ICOs to do is to boost massively on the economic application size. But actually in the short term, when we've got no constraints on the amount which is being raised, uh, when often these raises aren't being, aren't being raised for specific business applications, aren't we, all, aren't we really just pushing up on the oh speculative side? Oh my God, side? we're just getting warmed up. Like, so so um, in my previous company in 1999, in like, I don't know, April, May timeframe, 1999, we raised $20 million. And, and thank God, because we got, we, got, we, got, we got relisted back to NASDAQ, and so it was fantastic. We were all really excited. And, and we knew we were going to have to raise some money further in the future, and we're sitting around Christmas of 1999, and NASDAQ's on its way to 5,000. We're going like, dude, we, we really need to get in on this action. <laughs> this is a really good idea. So first week of January, we pick up a phone, we call our investment bankers who'd done the deal the year before, and we're like, we need to go raise some money. They're like, you just raised money. Yep, we're like, NASDAQ 5,000? We should be raising money. So four weeks, we put together an entire offering into the public market. It was a NASDAQ national market cap traded company. We went out and we we're like, let's go raise another $20 million. That'd be great. So we start our roadshow, stock at 11, start our roadshow going out to raise $20 million. We came home six weeks later with $122 million priced at 34 with the stock trading at 43 and Bain Capital took $34 million of the transaction. We sold 3.2% of the company and that year we did $56,000 in revenue. So when you guys got to get ready to do this, like this was fully NASDAQ compliant, da 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 da, da. <laughs> so, so I would just say we lived through this. We, we're not even close to the scale. We're like in like round off error. You can't even get to 1% of what went on in the dot com. Now the question is, how are you enjoying the dot com? Like you like all this video stuff you got on your phones and this multimedia stuff is actually pretty good too. And we got wireless networking, that, that's working out all right. And we've pretty much got better than DSL bandwidth almost everywhere on the planet, except my house. Um, and, and so, you know, there's the good news side of, you now, so this thing crashed. We lived through the crash too, it was fine, like, I don't know, 12 months later we had 20% um, of the market cap we had. We, we bounced the sucker off a $2.5 billion market cap. We could have bought a General Motors division, right? I mean, it was crazy. And yet, you can survive through that process and, and yet build incredible things. And so, you know, companies suffered out of it and, and people had a hard time, but we didn't end up with every company in a shareholder lawsuit. So, I don't know, just a, a little sort of a reality check in this. It's okay to raise capital and to put it together and put it to good economic use. And some people do, like pets.com. Right, remember that? Uh, the, they, they raised, yeah, yeah. Like, Two hundred million dollars. So we get it was fantastic. It was fantastic. So like, go back and just remember that like we're humans. We do this stuff over and over and over again. We can't fix ourselves. Okay, time for I think uh, two, two, three more questions. Um, and if you obviously you want to speak, ask Stephen a question, please, please do so. Uh, hi, I'm Luke. I'm a corporate lobbyist. Don't boo. Um, we've heard a lot about how the industry itself can be its own biggest risk. With 
the gambling industry, we've heard about how you know there are, there are different models, but really the reason that it's not legalized in the US is because of the casinos, because of Sheldon Adamson, because uh, of a protectionist model. The reason that we haven't had decent streaming services is because of the Hollywood and uh, you know all those industries. How, who, who are your external enemies and how are you gonna win them over? Well, for raising money, your external enemies are the people who raise money from, right? Investment banks, VCs, these types of people who say, oh, the moral hazards are so terrible, we have to shut this whole industry down unless we're the ones running it, in which case it's actually a wonderful industry and it's an innovative new way to create liquidity, right? So, uh, and it's just like how digital music worked, right? Uh, they tried to say that there's only one way to do that and then people kind of force their hand in the matter. Um, on the other hand, certain other industries have been shut down successfully. For example, the online gambling business, where they did this, was it 2007 when the crackdown came from DOJ? Yeah, anyway, they did that, and then it's like with $4 billion industry, now it's like a $40 billion industry. So yeah, how's that working out for you, DOJ, right? There's, there's against Costa Rica every year. Right. Just on Sportsbook. Right, so. and, and so, and so uh, you have to ask yourself, are you creating a good outcome or are you just protecting an existing business model? Unfortunately, in my experience, most regulation is about protecting incumbents. It's less about outcome. That's why we keep having collapses over and over again. It's kind of funny, remember 2008 where you said we're gonna to end too big to fail by making the banks larger. Okay, so uh, I think some of that's there, but I do think we're gonna have a BitTorrent-like effect where capital is now too liquid. Also, monetary policy as a whole is not being run well by central banks. They're just printing and printing, and the interest rates are not where they need to be. So there is a flight to alternative value. And what I think is going to end up happening is we're going to have just a tokenization of value for everything. So, you know, I've been traveling all around Europe. I started in Odessa, and then I went to Athens, and I went to Zurich, and then I went to Germany, and then I went to England. What's unique about it? Every one of these countries has different money. I guess Germany and Greece have the same money now. But... I paid in dollars for everything. I never exchanged, because I have a card, right? So when I bought something, I was paying in dollars, they got paid in the local standard. So why conceptually is that any different than me being able to have tokens representing pretty much anything I want? Land, gold, silver, these types of things, and holding them in a universal wallet on my phone, and there's a decentralized market maker that lives in between, and there's a payment service that happens to accept this stuff. The merchant always gets paid what they want. I'm paying in airline miles or gold, or any of these things. Well, the point of this is that the very same technology that makes that a reality also enables online gaming and gambling, also enables content sharing, it enables a lot of really good things. So I think it's going to be rather pyrrhic if a regulatory crackdown comes. My belief is it will because of incumbency protection, but I believe like BitTorrent, it's going to actually, these markets and this tokenization is going to be so pervasive, it is going to force the entire regulatory system to change. And how this space is perceived, how people are going to treat cryptocurrencies is completely up to us as a community. And we need to treat ourselves a little bit better and take better care of ourselves. If you eat nothing but junk, shouldn't be surprised if you're fat. See, I got my belly right here, right? There's a lot of ribs in here and a lot of steak in here, okay? Uh, I sh it's, it's, that's my point. Well, we got, I think, about time for one more question. So he's a lucky person to ask the final question before Stephen speaks. Show of hands. One more question. No takers? Oh, no. come on, kids. Ah, oh, we got one back there. One, one back there. Well, hey, there we go. I mean, so just a kind of counterpoint. I, I mean, there are a lot of problems with the ICOs, but it's not like the current system we have on whole is that great. And I think Stephen was alluding to this. I mean, yeah. It's not as though everything that gets issued in the equity markets is a great business. It's not as though those businesses don't fail. And then on the whole, I mean, you know, anything could happen with ICOs too. It's very new, but the way equities are sold, the way IPOs are sold, someone like me, you know, or the average person here has, has barely any chance. I mean, most of these things in the US, you have to be an accredited investor. And even right. then you have to go through a broker dealer. Right. You've got the exchanges in the middle of things. I mean, you've got a very centralized you know, structure. You have a lot of rent seeking uh, at different layers. Um, and while I agree that you know, the ICO market right now is a wild west in a sense, uh, on the other hand, I mean, it does, at least for the moment, cut out a lot of this centralization, cut out a lot of this rent seeking. I can, on the whole, 
be certain that what I'm getting for the money I put in is the token that is being sold. I, I don't I don't have questions like am I actually getting the share that's being sold that you might um, going through an IPO process without a broker dealer and then I, I guess more people maybe get to participate for now. I, I don't think it's so bad necessarily if even these high risk asset classes are founded or funded by you know a lot of people giving right. a little bit of money rather than just a small pool of accredited investors giving a lot of money and them being the only ones who can like rise or fall with the tide. I, right. I think I think more of us, at least now, might have an opportunity. Right, to, and, to and actually you bring up a very valid point. And another uh, counterpoint to strengthen your yeah. argument is the fact that you now actually can have money anywhere. You know, if you're born in Nigeria or Ghana, good luck getting Silicon Valley investment. It's not going to happen. But now everybody's on the same stage with ICO. So there's a lot of power there. It opens up liquidity to everyone in the world. My only grievance is not with the mechanism of how we move what value from Alice to Bob. It, it's about this desire to abandon basic business principles, like due diligence and verification of claims and uh, knowing who your customers are so you can protect them or at the very least have a relationship with them because after all, they made what you're doing happen. You have some sort of moral obligation to them. Um, this is my primary criticism for it. And the issue is, is we as a field don't do something voluntarily, either through our actions or through self-regulation or through some sort of smart contract-driven standard, then it's going to be done on our behalf by the people who want to end this field. And as a consequence, it'll set us behind a bit. Won't end it, but it'll set us behind. And it'll actually reduce good outcomes. That's my primary grievance uh, with this, this whole thing. The other side of it is that I am deeply disturbed by insider trading. This is one thing that you know, the Knickerbocker crisis in 1907 taught us. Uh, leading up to that, you had a situation where everybody knew everything in the inside. They, like you were alluding to, these accredited investors, these insider guys. And they legitimately actually got information before anyone else. So they knew when a collapse was coming, they knew when a balance sheet was bad, and they could buy and sell based on that information at the expense of every single other person. And it's taken quite a bit of time for us to get to a point in the markets where they're a little bit fairer. They're not quite, there's still tons of problems. The Facebook IPO is a great example of that. Um, and there's others. Yet, in cryptocurrencies, we've now regressed because if you don't actually do any compliance, the problem is you have no idea of knowing who actually participated, as I alluded to earlier. So you mentioned the monetary policy. You know you got a token. Well, if we said there's a million tokens, but the reality is actually 99% are owned by Bob, who's just going to play around for a little bit at your expense. There's been more than one dubious offering in the space that's done that. And I think that's one area that we really do as a community need to, to clean up a bit. Anyway, I've taken way too much time. Steve, I know you have a great presentation. All right, everyone, a big hand for Charles Hoskinson. Thank you very much.